being affected seek to address continue unabated. The arms trade continues unabated. The development of, uh, of nuclear weapons continues unabated. The, the development of, of, of autonomous weapon systems continues unabated. The forced migration and all of that continues unabated, even as the forums themselves have been affected. So this is an important moment to have a conversation about the impact of, of, of the COVID pandemic, specifically in the context of transparency. Transparency, I should say, bringing it to the arms trade treaty context, has never been an afterthought. It was always, and those of you who have followed the arms trade treaty since before it came into force, know that transparency, more than an afterthought, is a core pillar of the arms trade treaty. It is specifically uh, spelled out in the text of the treaty, and it carries with it specific obligations. So transparency, transparency in this context is not merely aspirational but it actually creates specific legal obligation and specific uh, expectations uh, from civil society, from other states parties, and uh, et cetera, that need to be complied with by states parties to the arms trade treaty. So that is the context in which we, we are having this conversation. And even before COVID hit, transparency was already a concern for us in the context of, of, of the arms trade treaty. But COVID has exacerbated these concerns. And we, are, we, are, we have certain pre preoccupations from the perspective, perspective of civil society about the duration of any measures that are, going to be, that are going to be taken in the name of COVID, to address COVID, to work around COVID, et cetera. So nobody denies that COVID is a reality, of course. Everybody understands that there are certain disruptions. Everybody understands that there are certain mechanisms that need to be adjusted, et cetera. But this is not tantamount to letting up on vigilance, the, to letting up on a scrutiny of states parties from civil society, from other states parties. And this is no excuse, the COVID pandemic, to establish measures, mechanisms, processes, et cetera, that are going to outlast the crisis, however it subsides, and that are going to start closing spaces for civil society, that are going to restrict transparency for state parties, et cetera. So this is a conversation about the present, but also a conversation about the future. We need to, again, be vigilant to ensure that the measures that are being implemented today with good justification, it seems, in the name of COVID, are really necessary and are not going to outlast the specific circumstances, the exceptional circumstances for which they were created. We already know, for instance, the five yearly meeting of the, of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was, was uh, postponed, CCW has been affected, the Arms Trade Treaty, Happy, uh, Conference of States Parties took place, is taking place exactly the week it was supposed to take place, except it is taking place virtually. And this is, you know, we, we appreciate the efforts, uh, the, the momentous uh, efforts by, by all parties involved to, to work around this difficult situation, but at the same time, we maintain our voice of, 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 of uh, concern, of vigilance, of, of alert, that any measures, again, taken in the name of COVID are not. Are, going, are not going to close spaces that have been so well earned by civil society, are not going to curtail transparency among states parties as it relates to reporting obligations and, and, and similar obligations, and are going to be assessed going forward as to their necessity, their applicability, and their justification. Any measures taken today are exceptional, but they cannot be understood to be a normalization of things going forward in terms of access uh, to civil society, in, in, in terms of openness, and in terms of, of uh, transparency. There is a silver lining, however, I think, to the COVID crisis and transparency. In the context of the Arms Trade Treaty, we often speak of lessons learned. We often speak of collaboration, cooperation. We often speak of, of information sharing. These same dimensions are also, you know, uh, being considered in the context of the COVID crisis. There's a lot of information sharing, there's a lot of cooperation, there's a lot of best practices, lessons learned being shared. So we feel that there might even be a, a silver lining to this, so, uh, to this COVID crisis in as much as, as it, 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 it uh, incentivizes cooperation in other realms beyond public health, including as it relates to arms control, to arms control uh, diplomacy. So, so this is, this is uh, the, the general context for the conversation and our, our speakers are going to, to address some, some specific uh, topics related to the importance of transparency more generally in the, and, and the role of civil society, transparency specific 
specifically in the context of arms transfers uh, decisions. We're going to look at trends in the context of the ATP and the, and the general decline in public reporting that we have observed over the, over the past few years. Uh, well, there have been six conferences of six parties over the, the past six years. And we're going to, to hear more generally about the impact of the COVID crisis on multilateral diplomacy, on digital diplomacy, how this is taking shape. Uh, and, and, and there's already some empirical recent evidence to sort of assess how this is playing out and how it may continue to play out uh, going forward. So, so with that, it gives me great pleasure to, to introduce our first speaker. So, uh, Ms. Maricela Munoz, she's Minister Counselor at the Permanent Mission of Costa Rica to the United Nations in Geneva. She has more than 20 years of experience in multilateral diplomacy, working with governments, international organizations, the private sector, and civil society organizations, particularly in the areas of international security, disarmament, and non-proliferation. Ms. Munoz has held senior positions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Worship of Costa Rica, and as, as well as at various international organizations. Uh, while she speaks and while the other speakers are, are, are taking the floor, please make use of the chat function. We will be uh, collating and referring to these questions uh, later on in the session, and, and, and the speakers will be, will be very happy to address them uh, at the appropriate time. Without further ado, Maricela, please, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Cesar. Well, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this uh, time of the um, developments of the Conference of the Six Bodies of the ATP. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and your kind words. Um, I concur with you that uh, COVID-19 has disrupted not only our lives, but uh, the work of the multilateral forum. However, I think that, as you mentioned, we need to, to be very responsible as how we approach the work in, in those um, contexts, in those platforms. And also, we need to be forward-looking and see how can we take this opportunity to strengthen uh, these processes vis-a-vis uh, -vis weakening them. And I think that there is great opportunity for us to do the first. So, as you know, Costa Rica is one of the founders of so we attach great importance to its developments and its work and its consolidation. And I think that um, talking about diversion and, and transparency uh, today is, is really timely because of all the different challenges that we are tackling, not only with the pandemic and how its effects are, you know, um, cross-cutting uh, across many uh, dimensions in our lives, but also how we can make sure that in these times of our center uncertainty, we continue working uh, for our goals. And I also uh, think that the participation of civil society was definitely not an afterthought. Uh, you guys have been with us uh, from the very beginning and before, uh, even when we were talking about uh, how to enhance um, international trade of, of arms uh, in, in a time of um, a lot of crises were happening in, 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 in the origins of, of the ideas uh, regarding the ATP. So thank you for being there from the very beginning. I think that um, we all decided in that case to, to establish the highest standards uh, for the international trade of weapons. And there was a purpose attached to that intention. And it was to reduce uh, human suffering, to increase responsibility, and, and accountability by the states and other um, stakeholders involved in that trade and to, to enhance transparency, for sure. And, and it's important to underscore that that was the, the north that guided our, our efforts. I think that um, it is important also to highlight that if we ask ourselves how can we promote uh, international cooperation, um, we need to count on the collaborative efforts of all the different stakeholders. And in the case of Costa Rica, the participation of civil society uh, is done in an equal footing. We, that's even established in our own legislation, not only in the context of the ATP, but for other uh, important processes. And the importance also of your uh, support to enhance national controls on legislation uh, has a direct impact in tackling organized crime, terrorism, 
and other illicit activities. So we count on your um, inputs to, to enhance our, our different uh, policies and, and the um, actions of the institutions that uh, deal with these, with these aspects. Um, we also keep in mind that it is important to relate uh, public and national security with international security. And I think that through the ATP we have common standards, we have a common language to enhance obligations and responsibilities and also to talk to each other to sustain not only peace in the world, but also uh, to sustain economic development, to sustain inclusivity, etc. And um, in the context of the ATP, uh, we have seen that the protocols have allowed for this sort of compatibility among the states. So we can share our experiences as, as our best practices and also be very honest about uh, the issues that we can improve. And in the case of Costa Rica, of course, uh, we have a very forward, we have been very forward looking in the sense that we have established bilateral and regional cooperation platforms to talk about all the different obligations within the treaty, and in particular, uh, Article 11 on, on diversion. And we have exercised uh, this uh, sort of uh, initiative not only in, in the sense of um, informal or formal talks, but also developing even uh, common understandings and, and activities uh, and fora for this purpose. And we have seen uh, the, the positive impact of how these interactions and honest feedback and exchanges between the states with your support has uh, enhanced our, our goal. Um, I think that um, we know that illicit trade nurtures uh, from legal markets as well. In general, arms trade accounts uh, to $95 billion in, in operations. And that sometimes uh, occurs, many times I would say, in areas in conflict. And our region does not escape that reality. And that's why we attach great importance to the support that we receive from scholars, from civil society organizations, from private sector, to see how can we um, improve the disaggregated data that will give us the, the, the important information, the updated uh, tools to enhance uh, how we tackle the, 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 the use of firearms that impact um, not only conflict, but also our lives. You know, we see figures in homicides, suicides, gender-based violence going up. And this is a, a great a great preoccupation, not only to my country, but uh, to, to my region in general and to other colleagues in the context of, of the treaty. Because we have been discussing about these issues for, for a long time now. And I think all this progress is achieved in a multi-stakeholder, a multi-dimensional setting. Um, we need to keep in mind that to create the capacities, to coordinate efforts, to raise awareness, one of our key strategic partners is civil society. I cannot underscore that enough. Uh, you guys are experts in raising awareness, developing campaigns, and, and providing us with the legal and technical support that sometimes is very difficult for us to access, especially uh, with the flexibility that is needed. And, and the, 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 the context sometimes is so evolving that our institutional structures do not follow that. that um, that activities and, and that, um, you know, that de those developments and you guys are always ahead of us and ahead of the curve in terms of providing us with, with the, the needed uh, support. And you also have very important networks and intersectorial alliances. And I think that in the context of the ATP in particular, these key elements enhance not only the um, strengthening of the obligations of the treaty, but makes the connections to other UN mechanisms, including human rights and international human, humanitarian law regimes. And we need to keep uh, a lot of attention um, ad and, and address these interconnections um, in a substantive manner. And I need that there is uh, room for improvement in the, in the works that we have been developing, developing in the treaty because it's a relatively young treaty. And, and that's why we keep learning and um, enhancing the information and the practices. Um, to finalize, I think that um, we shared your concern about the um, 
unwillingness of certain uh, parties to share information with the argument of uh, confidentiality or, or national security measures. Uh, we understand those, we respect those, but I think that there is also opportunity to be uh, a little bit more open about this information uh, because it brings us back to the reason why we, we adopted this treaty. What was that that we needed to accomplish? And if we are not in a position to share uh, key information that will help us and enhance our responsibilities, the compliance with the obligations, uh, tackling diversion, then I think that um, this deserves a serious reflection. Um, we have also um, advocated, especially during this cycle, because of the unprecedented circumstances in which it developed, uh, for the inclusion of civil society in equal footing uh, for civil society organizations to have access to all the information according to, to Article 4 uh, of, the, of the treaty. And um, we will continue to advocate for that. And uh, lastly but not least, uh, I would like to say that we are also paying a lot of attention to the development of the Diversion Exchange Forum because we, we think that it's a very important uh, platform, but um, it will require, um, you know, active and strong uh, participation but by all stakeholders. And uh, we will try to ease uh, the concerns and, uh, and um, interpretation in terms of the different uh, layers that may be in place for all stakeholders to, to be able to participate. I think that as the, as the treaty matures, we need to be able that uh, inclusiveness stands strong, as has been the, the custom of the treaty, and the participation of all states as well, developing states, and, and we have uh, also worked a lot uh, to make sure that they have access to the sponsorship program, to the BPF, and, and all, all the stakeholders in, in general. So I, I really appreciate that we, we have this opportunity this afternoon to talk about how important transparency in, in the way we carry out our business uh, is, is maintained and enhanced, and of course, how that will impact in a positive manner our efforts in tackling diversion. So thank you again. Muchas gracias, Marisela. Thank you very much for that. Uh, lots of food for thought there. Uh, I mean, I do want to express uh, my appreciation to, to your government, to the government of Costa Rica, for, for, for the, the, the openness that you have shown towards civil society in these, in these multilateral security processes, which, is, which can, cannot always be taken for granted, you know, in general. So it's, it's very much welcome. And you can continue to count, count on us, on the, on the input that civil society can bring. I mean, we, we do believe with humility that there, are, there is certain expertise that we can bring to the table and, and, that, and that, that it can enrich the debates in the, in the context of the ATP. So thank you very much for, for that. Uh, just briefly, you mentioned the concept of, of, of security. I think it's, it's, it's remarkable how the very concept of national security is, is in a way being, being redefined, revisited in the context of, of the COVID crisis. What constitutes national security? What constitutes effective preparedness? And you will see that peculiarly, it's not the main arms exporters who are faring better, you know, in, in terms of dealing with the, with the crisis or, or, the, or the countries with the biggest expenditures in, 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 in weaponry or, 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 or anything like that. In many ways, quite the opposite. I mean, uh, uh, preparedness is, 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 is being, being now defined as, you know, investments in science and then redirecting military budgets to other, to other endeavors. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very peculiar uh, dynamic now as it relates to our understanding of security. Our next uh, speaker is Mr. Frank Schleiper. Mr. Schleiper is, is leading the arms trade project at PAX in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a peace organization based uh, in the Netherlands where Frank has been working on international security and international arms export control issues for more than 25 years. He has been involved in efforts to enhance transparency in, in Dutch arms exports. And of course, he's a familiar, familiar face to all of us who have been working on the international stage uh, uh, in the arms trade treaty. So Frank, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Cesar. Thank you for the introduction and good day and good night, everybody, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much also Control Arms for organizing and inviting me to this panel, which of course is a great honor and pleasure. 
Um, and obviously, as mentioned, it's very unfortunate that we have to assemble virtually and that we miss the personal contact and the more interactive debate that we would normally have had in the world without Corona. Um, on the positive side, I understand that these online side events attract far more attendees than we would normally have had if this was one of the rooms of the conference center in Geneva where we had otherwise convened. So that is a, a, a positive side as well. Uh, and, and therefore also a thank you everybody um, around the world who, who have taken the time to tune in and, and participate in this event. Um, I've, I've been asked to share some thoughts about transparency in decision making over arms exports in relation to the arms trade treaty, um, which of course I'm uh, very happy to do. Um, and, and looking back a little bit uh, over the past years, uh, since the first AGT conference of state parties back in 2015 in Cancun in Mexico, progress has been made in setting up the different working groups for the treaty discussing many relevant aspects of the treaty and its implementation. But unfortunately, only marginally have states been discussing the everyday arms trade, which maybe was logical in some ways in the first two, three years of the ATT, as, as most attention was going to the bureaucratic side of things, setting up the machinery to, to make it function. Um, at best, in those early years, we could hear a few states illustrating their export licensing decision-making process from a rather generic perspective, which at that time could at least be seen as a starting point towards a more in-depth discussion. But even then, I must say, it often felt hard to understand why, after years of negotiating a treaty with its core purpose being to reduce human suffering, now that it had finally entered into force, that it appeared unwanted, inappropriate even, to discuss or even refer to concrete examples of human suffering by armed violence and how the arms trade played a role. And so when, in those early years, I asked officials at HET meetings whether they maybe could push start such a discussion a little bit more. I was often told that we civil society should be a little bit more patient as this was a new treaty and it needed some time to settle. Fortunately, over the past two, three years, this has changed a little bit. A few states have indeed made the effort to elaborate in plenary sessions about how they decide about real world cases of arms exports. They're often largely anonymized cases though, which again, maybe was fine for a start. But up until today, most of the cases that have been discussed in more detail took actually place in the margins of the ATT over side events such as this, for example, about the conflict in Yemen and the role of arms supplies to the warring parties that have contributed to unimaginable human suffering. Sadly, from the side of states involved in such transfers, there was mostly silence, no answers, no explanations of why they had allowed these arms transfers in the light of their obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty. So at this point at CSP6, I believe it really is high time that states make a much more serious effort to integrate discussions about how states come to decisions to grant or to deny export licenses for certain types of weapons to certain users in certain destinations. Because at the end of the day, I believe this is at the core of the ATT. And I understand this may sometimes be uneasy, but if life was easy, we didn't need an arms trade treaty. I can't believe that states ever thought that the ATT would not be dealing with this sort of questions and discussions. So why are they so afraid? And honestly, I don't believe that the arguments that you of course often hear um, to not publicly discuss concrete examples of arms exports to a large, large extent are 
basically unfounded and often simply are a way to avoid an explanation. I've never myself been convinced that any security or commercial interest would really be at stake. Also in this context, I, I refer to the Closed Door Diversion Information Exchange Forum, or DEEF, that has been decided on this week and presented as a means to have easier conversations about concrete cases on diversion, but only for state parties and signatories not for civil society and other stakeholders, except on special invitation. I could maybe live with that if there was already a decent standard of open information exchange and the DEEF would be a mechanism to enhance that even further, more detailed conversations where export licensing officers could discuss with intelligence or customs agents from other countries why they consider it a big risk or not to export these missiles to that country or, or something along these lines, but this is unlikely to be the case, I believe. So I actually hope that when this forum is being reconsidered in two years' time, states conclude that the level of discussion in the DEEF does not warrant secrecy, and that the very same discussions could also take place in the public place, in the public space. So to conclude, I, I want to briefly refer to an example from, from my own country, um, but before I do so, I should maybe mention a potential conflict of interest here, as my organization PAX is receiving funding, funding from the Dutch government. However, I believe this has never been an obstacle for us to engage in open and honest discussions and where we may sometimes clearly disagree about decisions taken. With that disclaimer, in the Netherlands, I have witnessed how we have moved from a state of near secrecy around the mid-1990s about arms transfers towards a situation where every single export license has been made public with a little delay, with the omission of a few potentially, <clears throat> indeed, commercially sensitive details, but where we can have a discussion about sensitive export licenses and actually where the government opens the door for such discussion as it has obliged itself to publicly explain in letters to parliament why it believes major arms transfers do not violate their arms export policy. And back in the day when this all uh, came into being, we heard the same objections to transparency, that it would violate security and commercial interest and that the customer would not allow Sessions in Parliament were also partly used behind closed doors. But over time, pushed by civil society and the media to open up, the government has shifted step by step its position. And today, I believe hardly anyone acknowledges that the current level of transparency is a national security threat and that discussions that it enables are problematic in any way. Even industry agrees that as soon as they have the export license, there's very little reason for secrecy. In fact, they will often release press releases about the arms deals themselves. Of course, this doesn't mean that transparency guarantees strict implementation of the arms trade treaty, but at least it allows for a proper discussion. And in fact, it may lead to adjustments of policies based on new insights. And still, we can strongly disagree about the outcome of the discussion, but at least we have that discussion. Sadly, as we heard yesterday in, in the control arm side event, and, and I can imagine Cindy will uh, refer to it as well later uh, today, um, transparency is not normal practice generally. And in fact, the tendency within the HT appears to be an increase in, in confidential reporting, um, which is sad, especially for, for such a young treaty. Still, I'm hopeful that over time, fear of getting cold feet will be taken away when more states will show leadership in explaining licensing decisions and showing openness to discuss cases in public. 
Transparency in arms trade decision making is dearly needed, no less so in times of a pandemic. It helps states to learn from each other's best practices and eventually, I would hope, this contributes to higher quality decision making that will enable to work towards that first and foremost goal of the ATT to reduce human suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. To reduce human suffering, indeed, uh, that, uh, that should, should be the guiding uh, principle, of course, informing these, these decisions. And, and thanks for your comments in tra uh, on transparency in general and in the Dutch context in particular. And I can tell you in the Canadian context, we have, we have struggled with the, this notion of commercial confidentiality, which nobody denies that it's a thing. It's a concept of commercial confidentiality, but oftentimes we fear that, that it's an overstretched understanding of what actually constitutes commercial confidentiality and that this very concept is used as cover to shield the public and shield states parties and shield civil society from information that ought to be transparent transparently made available i'm very glad you referred to this the diversion information uh, exchange forum and it, it's it, i think this is this is a perfect example that falls right at the heart of this discussion covid ATT, civil society inclusion, and measures that may move away from this tradition of transparency. And, and we have expressed concern, I believe Cindy will, will also say a few words about this, but this is one of those cases where we worry that the spaces that have been so hard earned by civil society with the support of safe parties may be closing. And it is that much harder to reopen them again after the, they're closed, even if we are under exceptional circumstances now under COVID. So, so let this be a moment to, 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 to remind all participants and, 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 and to say that these, that the decision, the draft decision 13 that, that created, established this diversion uh, uh, forum was, was, was something that left us wondering about the, 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 the inclusion of civil society, the, the reason why terms of reference were circulated to, to, to civil society and, and, and whether it might break away from a, from a tradition of transparency in, in the ATT. So, we'll, so that, that's, that, those are great examples, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from, uh, from Cindy Epps. Ms. Epps is an attorney uh, specializing in public international law. Uh, Ms. Epps began working in the humanitarian uh, disarmament field during the arms trade treaty negotiations in 2012, so before the entry into force, of course, of the, of the treaty, as a coordinator of the ATT legal project. And she continued to advise on legal and policy issues at control arms after the, adoption, after the adoption of the treaty. After serving as senior counsel in the public international law and policy group, Cindy returned to control arms as senior policy advisor and currently serves as acting, acting co-director. So Cindy, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Caesar. I appreciate it. And I, again, uh, like others, want to thank our panelists um, for joining us here today and as well thank our participants. Um, uh, again, you know, we've, we've all said it, it's a, it's a different kind of CSP we're having, um, but I am grateful for the opportunity to, um, to engage in side events, I'll be them, you know, virtual, uh, to, to make sure that the conversation, the discussion, and, and at times the debate um, can, can continue even um, under, these, under these more restrictive circumstances. Um, I'm going to speak about, and I wanted to say uh, thanks to Frank for, for enlightening us about kind of what's happening in the Netherlands, how these arms transfer decisions um, how it's, it's, it's possible for arms transfer decisions to be made public um, and, and, and the benefits of that. Um, I'm going to be talking about transparency in the context of reporting, as well as in the context of the ATT process. Um, as you know, of course, uh, transparency is one of the three central purposes of the ATT. Um, in Article 1 of the Arms Trade Treaty, it in, uh, states that promoting cooperation, transparency, and responsible action by states' parties in the international trade and conventional arms, thereby building confidence among states' parties. This is one of the purposes of the Arms Trade Treaty. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll speak about uh, transparency and reporting as well as in uh, the ATT process. And specifically on process, it's more in the working methods of CSP um, and its subsidiary and its subsidiary bodies, and of course, um, addressing, as other panelists have, um, the development of the Diversion um, Information Exchange Forum. 
Um, but first, reporting. Uh, what are the requirements for reporting? Uh, most of, uh, a lot of us on uh, hopefully are, are very familiar with this. Hopefully, states parties are quite familiar with this. But they really the 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 requirements are to initial uh, to submit initial reports one year after ratification or accession, and to submit annual reports each year on May 31st. Um, and as we heard yesterday from my colleagues at the ATT Monitor report launch. Um, ATT reporting is one of the cornerstones of effective treaty implementation. And why is it one of the cornerstones? Well, it enables states parties to demonstrate that they're implementing the treaty effectively. It helps to identify any gaps to enable states parties to access appropriate international cooperation and assistance. And it can also help build confidence among states regionally and internationally, and to provide the public with a better understanding of the arms transfer policies and practices of their governments. But Reporting cannot provide this type of support to treaty implementation without transparency. And transparency can't be achieved in this, in this area uh, just by selective disclosure of information to just a handful of stakeholders. It requires timely, accurate, comprehensive, and public reporting. So I'm just going to take you through those four elements of what transparency looks like in reporting briefly. Um, and some of this I will be drawing on some of the um, information that was shared yesterday at the ATT Monitor 2020 annual report launch. Um, but essentially, uh, one of the issues is that ATT reports must be timely. They, um, there is a trend toward late submission or no submission at all of reports. The analysis launched in this year's edition of the ATT Monitor report, annual report shows that on-time reporting rates for 2019 annual reports which were, are due at, on 31st of May 2020, were the lowest of any year. And of course, um, we have the COVID-19 pandemic to um, contend with. And hopefully, as, as my colleagues pointed out yesterday, this will be an outlier year. But unfortunately, the trend is, um, it, it is following the trend um, of on-time reporting rates dropping. Um, to date, less than half of states' parties have fulfilled their treaty obligations to submit annual, annual reports. And the analysis of initial reports shows that 100 states' parties were due to submit their reports, and only 76 have done so. And so how do we uh, encourage timely submissions? Well, the efforts of the Working Group on Transparency and Reporting have set out some methods to support states' parties in, in submitting these timely reports. Um, the development and implementation of an outreach strategy on reporting um, is certainly welcomed um, by control arms, and, and we're looking forward to, to um, contributing and, and, and seeing how that strategy um, takes shape. Another positive development is the consultations between C the CSP6 presidency and the non-reporting states that took place during this intersessional period. And we also welcome uh, the issuance of individualized letters to states parties, reminding them of their ATT reporting obligations. Control Arms has previously supported um, uh, previous CSP presidencies in similar outreach activities, and we as civil society work closely with our members to support their outreach efforts to governments in advance of this important May 31st reporting deadline. And it's important to remember that all ATT, all ATT stakeholders provide support to states parties in fulfilling these obligations and all have a role um, to play in supporting implementation. And the reports uh, must be also be accurate. The 2020 ATT Monitor report indicates that 92 states parties that had an obligation to submit annual reports, only 36%, sorry, 36 or 39% submitted a publicly available report that contained the minimum necessary information needed to assess their exports and imports. And among the 56 states parties that did not meet that threshold, 15 submitted a report that did not include the minimum necessary information and 41 did not submit a report or submitted one that was kept confidential. So to provide accurate information, Control Arms recommends that states parties utilize the reporting templates as they provide a framework for minimum baseline, a minimum baseline of consistent and comparable data. And this helps to identify trends in the global arms trade as well as opportunities for some supporting states parties, um, for supporting states parties in implementing treaty obligations. And they also must be comprehensive, these reports. Um, while some states parties have worked quite hard to submit more information in their reports than in previous years, 
we've also seen a trend that some states are reporting less information. And that's something that we definitely want to keep an eye on and hope that we can um, turn around. Um, in addition, with regard to comprehensiveness um, and accuracy, the level of disaggregation um, of, the, of the information that's provided um, is, is also um, a, plays a part in, in, in providing meaningful transparency. And um, states' parties should report on actual exports and imports, specify the weapon type, provide a number or value for each item, and clearly name the final exporting and importing country. And finally, they must be public. Um, the Working Group on Transparency and Reporting um, has stated that transparency in the international arms trade is a core component of the ATT, um, and that transparency can be obtained uh, in terms of reporting um, through transparent reporting and the accessible provision of reported data to the public. Unfortunately, each year, more and more governments have opted to keep their reports confidential. Um, and the number of confidential reports has increased from 2% in 2015 to 20% in 2019. The difficulty here is that when a significant number of reports are made confidential, it's not possible to review the implementation practices of these states' parties to compare their national control systems with those of other states' parties, or identify, again, identify opportunities for cooperation assistance to facilitate treaty implementation. Um, in particular, uh, we, we know that uh, on the agenda is the amend amending the reporting templates, which we think would be very helpful in this regard. And uh, just highlighting in that regard, in particular, changing the default setting of the annual report to public rather than available to only states parties would go a long way to, um, to alleviating some confusion that has ha been happening in the process and certainly to encourage public reporting. So on the reporting front, um, timely, accurate, comprehensive public reporting. It's all four of these elements taken together that will ensure that the ATT reporting is transparent. And now I'm going to move on to, to the ATT process and transparency in the ATT process. So it's also, of course, critical, uh, transparency is critical to the effective implementation of the treaty. And the ATT, as has been mentioned by some of the panelists um, earlier, is that the ATT is a unique treaty and it involves many different aspects of international law and diplomacy, from disarmament to export controls to stockpile management, to human rights, the law of armed conflict, terrorism, organized crime, all of these elements are are, are part of the ATT. And a treaty with such broad scope really requires the engagement of many different actors, perspectives, um, experience, and expertise. And as such, the provisions of the ATT and its rules of procedure support this type of open engagement, and they have from the beginning. The rules of procedure, uh, numbers three, four, and five, um, indicate that CSP participation will afford observer states, UN agencies, international organizations, civil society, and industry with the ability to attend the conference as observers, deliver statements at plenary meetings, receive official documents, and submit their views in writing to the conference. Um, with regard to civil society in particular, the treaty recognizes in its preamble the active role that civil society, including non-governmental organizations and industry, can play in raising awareness of the object and purpose of this treaty and in supporting its implementation. So unfortunately, at this stage, we can see in the ATT process a trend away from transparency. And I'll break that down into two different aspects. First is the aspect of the increasing closed doors with regard to the substantive work conducted in the CSB context. And the second aspect is in uh, the increasing number of closed debates on the adoption of confidential processes. Um, so first with regard to the substantive work, we can see doors starting to close in this regard beginning in 2018 at CSP4. Now here, the Working Group on Transparency Reporting adopted a three-tiered approach to address diversion. Um, two of these tiers involved closed procedures, uh, one of which was informal proceedings, um, I'm sorry, informal meetings among states' parties and signatories to discuss ways to detect and prevent diversion, as well as an information sharing portal open only to states' parties. And one tier involved open discussions in the working group on effective implementation of policy issues concerning diversion. So at CSP5 and then again in February 2020, um, these uh, informal meetings took place on diversion um, only among states parties and signatories. 
Um, also, an information exchange portal was created to allow confidential communication between states' parties on issues of diversion. And a closed area on the Secretary, uh, the ATT Secretariat website was established for use by states' parties only. Now, it's important to, for all of us, I think, even you know, in a civil society context, to recognize that the ability to share sensitive information confidentially among states' parties in meetings or through portals can serve to enhance the ATT's capability to detect and prevent diversion. And I just want to draw on what Frank was saying about the sort of the evolution of the, the process of the Netherlands in terms of disclosure and transparency in, in their arms transfer decisions. It can be done, but we also recognize the, the, the value of having some channels of states parties only communication and consultation in this regard. However, um, and, and of course, these kinds, of, conf these kinds of, of, of communications can in turn allow for better and more effective treaty implementation and can contribute more generally to the transparency in the arms trade. However, establishing multiple closed processes in any context, and particularly in the context of a single issue here on combating diversion, really sets a dangerous precedent. Um, and namely, what, what that is, is in normalizing the regular exclusion of observer states, international organizations, UN agencies, civil society, and industry from participating in the substantive implementation work of the CSP. So um, we really need to think about um, the, the development of the Diversion Information Exchange Forum and, and what that means substantively um, to the otherwise open um, conversations that the ATT has has really supported um, in its in its rules of procedure in its treaty language and that the states parties um, thus far have really supported and I think benefited from these broad perspectives that are brought from um, the multitude of, of perspectives and individuals and expertise brought to the ATT CSP process. So just as we see substantive conversations around diversion closing, we also see increasing limitations with regard to process in the form of closed debates. Now, I'm going to focus on CSP6 in particular. Uh, we do see a rapid closing of public space for discussion and debate in the ATT CSP process. And of course, certainly continuing to this trend, as other, part as other panelists have mentioned, is the necessity to take extraordinary measures to move work forward while we remain under meeting restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we must be vigilant to ensure that the actions that are taken due, due to these exigencies do not unnecessarily restrict or undermine the ATT's purpose of transparency. In response to pandemic restrictions or otherwise, without actively and intentionally safeguarding space within the CSP process for open discussion and debate, transparency in the ATT process will continue to disappear. So what happened to, AT to transparency in the ATT process at CSP 6? Well, initially the written procedure adopted for CSP 6 intended, you know, in, in the view, in the in the wake of, of the COVID pandemic and its, and its restrictions, intended for the 17 draft decisions to be shared only with states parties. And this was subsequently changed after control arms and other civil society organizations, as well as supportive states parties raised their concerns. And this was really a welcome win for transparency and really instilled confidence that the process, despite the challenges posed by COVID-19, would be as open and transparent as possible. But the written procedure itself while a creative way to move the necessary work forward, um, the necessary work of the CSP forward, um, it proved challenging in that it provided fewer opportunities for open deliberation. And likely for this reason, many of the decisions before CSP 6 this year were indeed administrative and procedural in nature and didn't require as much extensive debate as some other more substantive decisions. But if one decision uh, stood out from the rest, and that is decision uh, 13. Decision 13 proposed to formalize the closed process, uh, of course, called the Diversion Information Exchange Forum. And the uh, Diversion Information Exchange Forum was born out of the closed informal meetings, initiated in 2018 and continued in 2020, and is restricted to states, parties, and signatories. Um, also included in draft decision 13 was the adoption of the terms of reference of this closed entity, um, access to which was also restricted to only states, parties, and signatories. 
Now, in ordinary circumstances, this decision would have been able to be discussed and debated in plenary at the CSP, and presumably with all access to all CSP participants, as we've, as we've seen in the last five CSPs. But here, there was no open access to any information about the framework or operation of this closed forum and no opportunity for debate um, due to the restriction to the written procedure. So an an, if we had an opportunity for open deliberation, that would have provided all CSP participants with a window into this process and into the operation of the Diversion Information Exchange Forum, if not its content. And this would have enhanced transparency in the ATT process. Even if content remained confidential, or some comp content remained confidential, having the debate would have provided an opportunity to ensure publicly that the process is clear, balanced, and in keeping with the principles, object, and purpose of the ATT and its rules of procedure. This also would have enhanced transparency in the ATT process. But these are not ordinary circumstances, and we are in the middle of a pandemic that requires significant shifts in working methods. Um, even with these necessary shifts in this time of COVID, there was an opportunity to make this decision that there was an opportunity to make a decision that could have championed transparency in the ATT process. Um, there is the push pull between progress and making, making the ATT work in this difficult time and also in making decisions that are open and transparent and um, involve uh, the input from all CSP participants. Now, it would, uh, one of the ways that this decision could have actually tra championed transparency is, would be to recognize the inability to have the necessary open discussion and debate and to move the formalization of the Diversion ex Information Exchange Forum into CSP7. And in terms of keeping the work moving forward during the CSP7 cycle, the forum could have continued developing informally while disclosing its terms of reference to all CS partic CSP participants for review. Unfortunately, the trend away from transparency in the ATT process did continue this year, and the Diversion Information Exchange Forum will be formally established without open discussion and debate and without disclosure of its terms of reference. Control arms will continue to work toward reversing this discouraging trend, and especially in the time of COVID-19, to support states' parties in improving transparency in the implementation of the ATT. And just in conclusion, uh, transparency in reporting facilitates honest, independent, and accurate assessments and analysis of treaty compliance, particularly related to export and import decisions, and it builds confidence among states' parties. And it also demonstrates effective treaty implementation, promotes good practices, and facilitates international cooperation assistance. Transparency in the treaty process enables civil society to play a crucial role in support Supporting the treaty's implementation and its reporting mechanisms. It also facilitates an input from a wide range of independent observers and other stakeholders that provide a variety of perspectives, ultimately ensuring both balance and substantive progress towards the treaty's implementation. Transparency is what makes the treaty more than a set of obligations. It's the commitment to the transparency by all states' parties that enables the ATT to bring the arms trade out of the shadows and affect meaningful change. Thank you. Thanks to you, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks to you, Cindy, for, uh, for, for that presentation and for so clearly articulating the, 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 the concerns around transparency in general and in particular about, about this Diversion Information Exchange Forum uh, uh, and the precedent and the troubling precedent that this, this, this uh, may set. Uh, you spoke about the very clear expectations around uh, accurate, comprehensive, and public reporting. But we are witnessing the reality, which you also said, that we're looking at late reports, no reports, and confidential reports. There is, so there is clearly a gap there that needs to be addressed. Last is uh, Ms. Bonnie Doherty. Last and certainly not least, uh, Bonnie Doherty is the Associate Director of Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection, and she's also a lecturer uh, on law at Harvard Law School's International Human, Human Rights Clinic. Ms. Doherty has worked in the field of humanitarian disarmament since 2001 as a lawyer, field researcher, and scholar. She participated actively in the negotiations of the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. She has also been a leader in efforts to ban killer robots and to strengthen international law on incendiary weapons and explosive weapons in populated areas. In recent months, she has spearheaded efforts to examine the, the implications of COVID-19 for humanitarian disarmament. 
Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Bonnie. Uh, thanks uh, for being with us. The floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Cesar, for the for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks also to Control Arms for hosting, organizing this event, and inviting me to participate. It's great to see so many um, participants on board. As someone said, it was one of the advantages of remote diplomacy is that we can have more participation in side events. So that is a, is a positive uh, effort and inclusion. While the previous speakers have addressed issues surrounding transparency in the ATT in the time of COVID, I'm gonna step back and examine cooperation and engagement across the field of humanitarian disarmament. I'll explain the important, importance of partnerships in humanitarian disarmament, discuss some cases where pandemic has presented challenges for ongoing civil society engagement, show why civil society is indeed an essential player in these processes and describe a specific civil society initiative that exemplifies its contributions to the field. And finally, I'll offer some recommendations for ensuring that cooperation and engagement important to humanitarian disarmament are preserved both during the pandemic and beyond. We are all at the ATT six meeting, six conference of states parties because humanitarian disarmament made this treaty possible. Humanitarian disarmament is a people-centered approach to governing weapons and seeks to reduce the human and environmental harm inflicted by arms. As several people have noted, the ATT explicitly aims to, quote, reduce human suffering and, quote, promote cooperation, transparency, and responsible action. It is one of four treaties that fall under the rubric of humanitarian disarmament, also including the bans on landmines, cluster munitions, and nuclear weapons, and it has influenced efforts for a treaty prohibiting lethal autonomous weapon systems, or killer robots, as well as the process to negotiate a new political declaration on the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. All these uh, processes are ongoing, so it's important to look at them across the board. The success of this approach to disarmament has depended in large part on its inclusivity and its partnership among states, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and survivors. These actors have worked together in the spirit of cooperation, collaborating closely, and communicating openly. Their joint efforts have been essential, both to the development of new international instruments and to implementation and compliance after entry into force. The spread of COVID-19 in 2020 has interfered with civil society's traditional involvement in the processes of humanitarian disarmament. The inability to convene in person has led to the cancellation, postponement, or reconfiguration of multiple multilateral meetings. Whether deliberately or inadvertently, alternative meeting structures have reduced civil society's roles in discussion. Some of the approaches have also reduced opportunities for small and or affected states to participate. And I'll offer a few examples outside the ATT context to supplement what Cindy has already outlined in this, the CSP6. First, in June, Switzerland hosted a PREPCOM for the CCM second review conference, which is currently scheduled for November. Each delegation was allowed to send one person to the UN in Geneva and as a result, CM Cluster Mission Coalition, a group of NGOs from more than 90 countries, was only represented by one individual. Others could watch the proceedings online, but there were no opportunities to engage in the discussion. This approach significantly impeded the exchange of ideas among states, international organizations, NGOs, and affected individuals that has helped advance humanitarian disarmament over the past 20 years. If a similar approach is adopted at the November Review Conference, it would be very problematic for civil society as well as, I, um, as I said earlier, small and, or, small and or affected states who may lack resources to attend in person. The Mind Van Treaty intercessional meetings, also held in June, were somewhat more effective. The meetings were virtual, were all virtual, which leveled the playing field among participants. They included civil society speakers as panelists and some of the inter attendees interacted in the chat box. Nevertheless, oral participation by online viewers remained limited. The Convention on Conventional Weapons uh, has yet to start its 2020 GGE on lethal autonomous weapon systems. While progress on this issue is important, many states have opposed holding remote meetings because they did not have access to adequate internet, which is an understandable concern. The chair presented two options to the body actually just this morning. First, he proposed a formal virtual meeting for two hours per day to accommodate different time zones. He specified um, explicitly that this meeting would include civil society organizations and give them the opportunity to present their views. 
Alternatively, he proposed an external partner could host an informal or hybrid meeting that would produce a working paper for the next formal meeting. Unfortunately, there was no consensus on these options this morning, and we just heard that the chair has resigned from his position. Whichever path CCW states choose for this process in the end, they should ensure civil society is allowed to meaningfully engage in the discussions. In 2019, before the pandemic, Russia ignored years of precedent and blocked civil society participation in a CCW informal session. That situation must be avoided in future CCW meetings, whether in person or digitally. Finally, Ireland has postponed negotiations of a new political declaration on explosive weapons in populated areas that had originally been scheduled for April. While the loss of a momentum due to the pandemic is understandably disappointing, Ireland has argued that an in-person forum is crucial at this stage of the process, in part because it wants to ensure full participation from civil society. While the pandemic may necessitate some flexibility about the structure of multilateral meetings, and Cindy highlighted that as well, remote diplomacy should not be used to justify limiting civil society's involvement and disarmament, either now or in the future. The international community should be mindful of these obstacles to engagement and exchange because civil society plays a crucial role at all stages of humanitarian disarmament. First, the approach is, in, is founded on inclusivity and partnership, as I, and as I noted earlier, is a, um, is a people-centered approach to disarmament. Therefore, it is important to hear all voices, including the people who are represented by civil society. Second, civil society brings a humanitarian perspective to disarmament issues. It pushes countries to prioritize the security and well-being of people over states. The value of a human security approach to world problems has been underscored by the health and economic consequences of the current global pandemic. Third, civil society has distinctive expertise that can inform the negotiation, interpretation, and implementation of disarmament instruments, as well as contribute to compliance monitoring. The on-the-ground presence of many civil society organizations allows them to document the effects of arms and offer operational solutions for addressing them. Other organizations provide detailed legal analyses of treaty texts or conduct in-depth research into arms stockpiles, transfers, or budgets. Affected individuals in particular can testify to the unacceptable harm caused by certain weapons and propose effective ways to address it based on lived experience. A recent civil society initiative exemplifies how NGOs can advance thinking in the field of disarmament. On July 2nd, 140 organizations headlined by all the major humanitarian disarmament coalitions released an open letter that urges states, international organizations, and civil society to follow humanitarian disarmament's lead to a new and improved post-pandemic normal. And hopefully we can add the link to that uh, letter in the chat box. The letter identifies four principles of humanitarian disarmament that can guide the way to a better future. Uh, first, humanitarian disarmament's focus on preventing and remediating harm calls for divestment for new production in unacceptable weapons and adequate funding to address past use. Second, international cooperation, including information exchange and resource sharing, should become the standard way to address global issues. Third, principles of inclusion and non-discrimination should inform the on-the-ground measures to address the inequalities that COVID has illuminated and exacerbated, including those faced by conflict individuals, conflict-affected individuals and persons with disabilities. And finally, most relevant for our discussion today, inclusivity as well as accessibility should underpin diplomacy, whether it is digital, in-person, or hybrid. The list of letters signatories reached 250 organizations just yesterday and includes disarmament, human rights, peace, faith, medical, student, development, and other groups. The breadth of this support shows how seriously the humanitarian disarmament community views the letter's call. In conclusion, I want to offer a few recommendations for how to address the recent impediments to civil society participation in disarmament. In the spirit of partnership, which has long been the hallmark of humanitarian disarmament, States should consult with civil society about how to best promote their meaningful engagement in these, specific, in these difficult times. A group of civil society experts, for example, recently produced a do's and don'ts of digital diplomacy, which offers guidelines for ensuring that remote diplomacy promotes participation rather than imposes barriers. And that um, document is also available online. In addition, states should publicly emphasize the value of civil society. 
in, in their engagement, including in statements at the UN General Assembly and various disarmament forums. Third, states should work with secretariats to guarantee that meetings, the remote meetings allow for constructive exchange among all participants and share information transparently. They should also ensure that problematic adjustments to diplomacy necessitated by the pandemic do not become precedent for the future or entrenched in rules of procedure. Civil society organizations themselves should also play a role in advancing their own engagement. They should reach out to states to share their expertise and insights and cooperate with states that seek opportunities to collaborate. Finally, I would encourage civil society organizations to join the open letter, which remains open for signature. And I urge states to embrace and share its message about the humanitarian disarmament model for a new normal in the, after the pandemic, during the pandemic and after it, it is over. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing the questions and the exchange on this side event um, that this forum allows. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Bonnie. That was excellent, and, and uh, thanks for those remarks. But thank you as well for your leadership on, in these, in these uh, uh, efforts to, to, to really uh, give some thought to the implications of COVID, including, of course, the letter. In case people did not notice, Raluca put the link to the open letter um, on the chat function I and mean, it's accessible there and it is still open for signatures and endorsements. So, so here's an invitation. I signed it, Project Pleasure signed it. I know many of us uh, have signed it. So, so it's an invitation for you to join and, and, and the, uh, the, the other document uh, that you worked with the team on, on, on the do's and don'ts of digital diplomacy is also linked there. So I encourage people to check that out. It is 10, 11, uh, well, in Canada, in, in Ontario. Uh, we have uh, just about 20 minutes and I, I should say we do need to end on time at, uh, at 1030 as scheduled. But fortunately, we do have a bit of time to address, <clears throat> to address a, a couple of questions. Thanks, uh, thanks to, to the participants who have posed questions on the, on the function. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to, to ask a couple of questions in succession and, and they're not directed at anybody in particular. But I'll just I'll just uh, open the floor to the panelists and see who wishes to comment uh, on them. So we so I'll, I think we have time for two for a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one uh, relates to uh, and it's from Fausto Brindis. Thank you, Fausto, uh, uh, for that. To the work with uh, with parliamentarians and the extent to which the attention given to COVID and the demands of COVID in terms of resources, attention, time, etc is taking away from attention to multilateral processes such as, such as uh, uh, the arms trade treaty. Uh, the question says, just to, to read part of it verbatim, um, while we have uh, raised the importance of working on the ATT, even during the pandemic, some members of parliament have signaled to us that their attention has moved towards COVID-19 and could sadly not follow up on their ATT or disarmament work. So the, the general questions uh, asked here in this context are how have governments reacted in terms of implementation of these obligations as they relate to the pandemic? Have they diminished their efforts or resources in, in terms of ATP implementation due to the demands and challenges posed uh, by the pandemic? Uh, and I would add, you know, going forward, do you think uh, this, if this is indeed a trend you observe, will, will it be, Will, will it get worse, basically, in terms of, of not being able to tackle both the pandemic and give the, the, the these disarmament processes the attention they deserve? So again, a question of resources, balancing priorities, if you will, and, and how that may affect implementation of the arms trade treaty. We have another question from, uh, from uh, Roy uh, Isvister, and uh, it's about the, these two similar yet different concepts of uh, information exchange and transparency. And they may often be used interchangeably, but they really refer to two different things, information exchange and transparency. Roy notes that on the paper, transparency and exchange of information, its role in the prevention of diversion, virtually all of the recommendations speak of information exchange, and none of them refer specifically to transparency. How do you understand the, 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 the relationship between these two concepts? I mean, does information exchange uh, uh, automatically entail that there will be transparency or, or, or are these two different dimensions that need to be tackled? So I hope that's, uh, that's, that's clear. Once again, to recap, first question on resources and, and, and resource allocation in, in the concept of the, the heavy demands 
uh, arising from the COVID pandemic, and secondly, information exchange versus transparency. So the floor is open, and, and, and please unmute yourself if you care to, to address either or both of these. Or I'll put you on the spot. Shall I? Oh, sorry, Maricela, you go ahead. Thank you, Frank. No, before Cesar puts me on the spot, I guess I will volunteer. <laughs> Thank you for your questions, and I have learned so much from the other panelists. It's really been uh, very informative, and also it's great that you guys uh, keep the bar very high for speaking uh, in terms of compliance with uh, our obligations to the ATP. I think that uh, as, as, as my country takes, um, you know, notes of what's being discussed today, it, it will help us enhance our actions in, in the next cycle of the, of the APP. And I think that um, we do not take lightly your inputs. Uh, we take them with great responsibility and, and we, we intend to, to make sure that some of the concerns that have been discussed today are uh, properly addressed. Um, in terms of the questions, I can always speak on behalf of Costa Rica, of course. Uh, we have not um, deviated any resources that were previously allocated to the implementation of the APT. Uh, on the contrary, I can tell you that we have highlighted that the pandemic has shown us the importance of the channeling uh, worldwide. Many of the resources that um, are used by, by major exporters and producers of, producers of arms um, need to be redirected to tackle climate change, to improve health systems, to improve education, to uh, promote economic development and trade, and uh, enhance innovation and technology, tackle the digital divide that Bonnie uh, referred to, uh, that you know has impacts in, in many many areas, not only in our access to virtual meetings, but in the future of our children. You know, in, in, in the opportunities that we make may give them to to access uh, better jobs and to have contributed uh, to to the economy. So um, I can also tell you that since um, when you refer to the group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapons, I. I I'm going to take the liberty also to, to share with you all that in the case of Costa Rica, uh, we have uh, been working with one of your allies, the, the Foundation for Development and Peace, Funda, Fumpale, uh, to, to enhance the interinstitutional exchange and coordination and production of inputs uh, for, for our work, for, for the work that we do within the group. And uh, this has been done in a virtual manner. And it's been very nice because we have been able to connect, albeit the time zones, the different time zones, uh, with colleagues in Costa Rica, in Europe, in the US, and, and here in Geneva as well, of course. And, and we have been having working sessions, not only panels, but working sessions, uh, you know, touching on humanitarian disarmament, legal aspects, ethical aspects as well. And it's been really, really encouraging to see that we have been able to advance the work uh, I'll buy the, the COVID-19 circumstances. So uh, that's addressing the question in terms of uh, the, the resources that may have been allocated to implementing not only the ADP but, but other treaties. So in the case of Costa Rica, we continue to, to, to enforce our, our commitment uh, towards these obligations. And um, there was another question regarding the transparency and reporting. I think that uh, Cindy was more than eloquent. Uh, signaling what uh, meaningful reporting uh, entails in terms of it being uh, complete, comprehensive, uh, timely, uh, accessible, uh, public. <laughs> and I think that when those characteristics are, you know, checked and are, are included in a report, then it may enhance transparency. Uh, but, you know, I think that um, we cannot say that the terms are interchangeable because if the quality of the reporting is not there, it won't enhance transparency. And uh, in the case of Costa Rica, we have taken a lot of time to produce our reports so far. We are still uh, 
finalizing the 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 2019-22 uh, report, you know, the, this cycle, because we are making sure that all the information that we include is uh, accurate, that we can include figures, uh, that we know that if there are disparities between the information, let's say in the control uh, department and the customs department and the security ministry, then we 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 work to to fix those uh, discrepancies and to, to understand what's going on, so the system gets enhanced and we can provide the most accurate and, and, and realistic information. Uh, but I think that in that case, uh, we learned a lot today from the presentation that Cindy uh, kindly gave us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. I couldn't agree more and, uh, on all counts. Uh, so thank you for that. And I'm very insightful about how, how Costa Rica in particular is dealing with this, with the, with the COVID uh, challenges. Um, any other thoughts um, uh, on either the, the resource allocation or the information exchange versus transparency? Um, hi, Cesar. I'll just briefly uh, talk about sort of the, 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 the key difference, I think, between, between the information exchange and transparency. And I think that that, that is a point that does get lost a lot in these, in these conversations. Um, it is very important to remember that information exchange is not in and of itself transparency. Information exchange is a method to, um, to reach or to achieve transparency. Um, so, uh, you know, some disclosure is not transparency. How that disclosure is made, if that disclosure is made public, if it's selective disclosure, it's not as transparent. If it's public trans disclosure, it is. If it's public disclosure of um, information that can't be comparable, you know, can't be compared to other information, it's less useful, it's less transparent. So I think it's important to remember that information exchange, while cr certainly critical, um, does not mean that you've achieved transparency. Um, and uh, that's, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that point is clear. I mean, it, it, it doesn't by itself ensure transparency. Information exchange could be information exchange that is not transparent or information exchange that is transparent. Of course, it's the latter that we are that we're uh, aiming for. Uh, Frank and Bonnie, no obligation to comment, but here's uh, the, the, the opportunity to do so. If you have any, any sort of final thoughts, please, Bonnie. Uh, just a quick uh, comment to say, you know, this is, these issues are applicable beyond, again, beyond the ATT. They have been definitely essential in this, the CSP, but also they, I have seen them arise in other contexts. And I mean, I think with regard to the first question, as Marcel mentioned, I mean, weapons production in some countries has been considered essential service and maybe the, the and that so those resources could, um, you know, is, is any time the right time to be in, investing in unacceptable weapons, but certainly not a time when uh, a pandemic does, uh, demands other attention. And also on the uh, cert certain groups that have been affected by conflict or persons with disabilities have faced uh, increased vulnerabilities as a result of the pandemic. So I think helping the pandemic, uh, helping address the pandemic can also help address their needs and they should be uh, kept in mind in the course of these um, discussions. And then with regard to the second question, I, th I think Cindy explained the, the difference very well. It's important not just that there's ex information exchange, but what it is and who it goes to. But I also want to say that part of transparency and even beyond is that the reason for this is that you need not just information exchange, but exchange of ideas, exchange, uh, d d debate, um, that is somehow information exchange seems more passive to me. But if you don't actually engage with all, if all parties don't engage in these discussions, you can't really share uh, reactions to the information or ideas about how to address the information and so forth. So I think you have to reach that extra level of exchange. Absolutely, Bonnie, thanks for that. Frank? Just very briefly, um, to, to referring to, to Fausto's uh, question on, on parliamentary involvement, Yes, clearly, I think, as in, in probably every country, um, people couldn't work, work was paralyzed in many ways um, at the start of the pandemic. And it's different in different countries, because depending on where you are uh, and, and how hard uh, the pandemic currently hits, it will influence work differently. 
Um, on the other hand, I, I could imagine that um, we've also, at least within the boundaries possible, adapted um, uh, over the, the course of the past months, and, and it, it, uh, yeah, it should be important also that, um, that, um, that we look at what is possible within these limitations, and, and that especially the very important work done by uh, parliamentarians is, is taken up slowly, but it's dependent, of course, also what um, governments can uh, can can supply in in terms of, for example, annual reports or or other stuff. Um, um, for example, in the Netherlands, we will have the annual uh, arms export control debate uh, early October, um, but we're still also waiting for the annual report because there were issues with uh, the the people who have to supply the data. They had to work from home and couldn't supply. Uh, on time, the the relevant information and all these sort of problems that um, will will happen in in different ways and forms in in other countries. Um, but um, also, yeah, try to be creative and and make it possible for the general public to follow parliamentary debates um, online from 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 their homes or or however. Um, and and the other point that, that Roy mentioned on on information exchange and transparency, yes, I think uh, it, it was um, well uh, uh, replied to already. Adding that um, I think where um, initially um, it it um, I mean I, I think my big worry is the trend that we see this um, building up of more and more cases of where um, the discussion or the exchange of information is not taking place in the public arena. And um, as I outlined, I, I doubt whether in all cases there really is a proper basis not uh, to, to withhold uh, the information from, from the public. And it, uh, it risks losing um, um, faith in, in um, the transparent process and transparent functioning of the treaty. And I think it's very important that states uh, keep that in mind. Well, thank you, Frank, and all of you. I mean, I think we, in, in different ways, address both questions that, that were posed, and, and we're nearing the end of our of our session. But I, I'd like to to actually repeat something I said at the outset, and and those of you who have followed have followed the Arms Trade Treaty since uh, since the very beginning will know that uh, th this issue of transparency is most definitely not an afterthought, and it is also not a matter of wishful thinking or or sort of uh, civil society aspiration or something. It is entrenched in the treaty. So we're not starting this conversation from scratch. We're starting this conversation from a formal commitment that all states parties to the arms trade treaty have already made to transparency. So any deviations from that are questions of non-compliance, but not questions of lack of clarity. I mean, there is a clear expectation of transparency in the arms trade treaty that, that all states parties need, need to comply with. And finally, I wouldn't be too surprised at efforts to resist transparency. That's part of the territory. So we need to be ready for that. And this is a constant struggle and there will be on different occasions, different efforts by different states or parties or stakeholders to obfuscate, to hide, to, to, to keep confidential matters that ought to be public. That is to be expected. You know, that is, that is to be resisted as well. We need to work together with states, parties. Transparency is not just important, and this is a very important point for civil society. There's a host of states parties that are equally supportive of transparency and of, of effective compliance with any provisions that deal with transparency. So this is an ongoing effort and we will, well, certainly from the perspective of control, control arms, we will continue to be, to be pushing this agenda. Thank you to everybody for, uh, once again for taking the time to join us today and a very, very special thanks to, to Cindy, Maricela, Cindy and Frank for your, for your excellent comments and, and expert insight. Thanks to Control Arms for hosting and facil fa facilitating and we will see you all next time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.